Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Pint Glass Football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler. What's up, PGF Nation? It's time to react to NFL Week 3, College Football Week 4. Cowboys are in serious trouble. Are the 49ers in trouble? How good are the Eagles? Sam Darnold playing like an MVP. College football had some incredible games. And guys, just a heads up, our NFL Week 4 and College Football Week 5 preview and betting picks podcast episode is going to be exclusively on YouTube this week. So be sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out. But joining me, of course, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, what is going on? Interesting week in the NFL from a betting standpoint, from a fantasy standpoint. A lot of injuries, especially if you're in fantasy. Uh, we're all being impacted here. But a lot of 0-2 teams got off the schneid. Shout out to my Raiders. Cam Ward, uh, here we go. We're going to jump into some of these games here. I want to start, Alex, with the Eagles-Saints. This is a game, obviously, that we highlighted last week as a game to watch here. Saints, look, they came back down to earth like we expected. We thought that this would be a game where Philly had an edge here, even on the road. Philly ends up winning an ugly ball game. Look, Jalen Hurts, you mentioned it last week that we needed to have a Jalen Hurts conversation. He throws a pick for the seventh straight game going back to last year. That's the most consecutive games of the pick in the NFL right now. He's become a turnover machine. And look, I think he's officially become the most overrated player in the NFL right now. He got paid essentially off of one great year. He's limited in the pocket. I still haven't seen the development from him in the pocket that I think we expected at this point in his career. And that's with two elite wide receivers. Now, I know he's been dealing with some injuries there at wide receiver. I get that. But I'm talking about his overall time in Philly here and a great offensive line, of course. Now, the Eagles are 2-1, and but they don't look like real contenders to me, Alex. I think the coaching in Philly is terrible. Way too many analytics-driven decisions. It's starting to feel a little like Brandon Staley is leading this team. Now, look, they're probably going to win, let's say, 10 games. I think that's realistic. They'll probably end up winning the NFC East. But I think this is a team that gets bounced in the playoffs either because of coaching or because Jalen Hurts is going to make a mistake in a big game. Yeah, I got to agree with you there and shout out to our uh, friend. We won't say his name and give him credit, but he did say he's be- he has a running bet that Jalen Hurts is going to throw one interception every single game this year. So far, he's been right. And to your point, Brad, yeah, Jalen Hurts needs to begin to try and take over in some way, shape or form. That's first and foremost, just as a player. Now, to your point in terms of this team, The reason that we see this team disheveled and discombobulated as such is because there is no leadership. All the leaders that were here are now gone, whether it be Sue, whether you want to say, obviously, Fletcher Cox, obviously, Jason Kelsey. We know Lane Johnson is there, but he wasn't the vocal leader that those two guys were on the offensive side and on the defensive side. So they're actually lacking players that are leaders. And when you don't have players that are leaders and Nick Sirianni, who will get fired at the end of this year and Bill Belichick will be brought in. But when you bring that, when you don't have leadership at any level, your team is going to look like this and it's showing on the field. We had, I I talked about Keller Moore being the OC of this team. I'm not even sure if it's, you know, really fair to even point the finger at him. Chicago Bears, Alex, I think they needed to move off of Matt Eberflus last season. Speaking of head coaches, you mentioned Nick Sirianni. I think his seat is hot, even with the 2-1 and one record. I think he is going to be gone at the end of the year, and I think Eberflus might join him here because, look, I said it going into this last – or I said it going into this season that it was a mistake keeping Eberflus. I know the defense looked good. He's a defensive-minded guy. I know the Bears have a history of defense, but they should have paired Caleb – with an offensive-minded coach. When you've got a young quarterback like this, you want to have an offensive-minded coach to help lead him, to help guide him. Look, Caleb hasn't been great. I get that. He's making rookie mistakes. He's hanging on to the ball too long. He's forcing some throws into coverage. That's what rookies do. I I think people are really overreacting to some of his play. 
But it's clear to me, Alex, that the Bears have easily the worst head coach and worst offensive coordinator in the NFC North right now. And I think it's hurting the development of Caleb Williams. Caleb flashed some big-time throws in this game versus Indy, 363 yards, two touchdowns. The talent is obvious. I think we know that, and you can see it when you watch the tape. But this franchise as a whole just looks dysfunctional right now, and I think it's hurting this young quarterback. Okay, so first things first, because I paid attention to the last two Caleb Williams games. Number one, he's still doing a lot of things that he did in college, and hence, similar to what Shador is doing, consistently looking over the first and second level, looking to the third level, those receivers down the field. Those are things that he's going to have to work on. However, there's what the player does, and then there's what the coaching does. Now, from your, what you were speaking to, Brad, the coaching, I guess we would say Shane Waldron in this instance as the OC, and in charge of the offense, and whoever the quarterback's coach is, they need to get Caleb to start looking down at the first and second level at the Swifts and the Rohan Johnsons, Khalil Herberts, and Cole Komets and Gerald Everett. I'm assuming they brought in Gerald Everett to be able to give him other weapons at that mid-tier level instead of going to the third level at those wide receivers. That's number one. Number two, this team, and this is not Caleb, this team needs to do something about the run game. I do not understand. They're 30th. They only average 72 yards a game rushing this season. They have got to get the rushing up. They have to commit a game completely to rushing the ball and get DeAndre Swift had 13 carries for 20 yards. That's not enough. They need to, I'm not sure what's going on with the offensive line. They brought in some people. They drafted his two first rounders on that offensive line. Something has to be done from the coaching standpoint because now I believe, I think we all believe in the players that they got. And now people even questioning drafting Roma Dunzier. I know we did as well. We also thought they should have gone after offensive line, but Roma Dunzier is a weapon and he showed us such with six catches for 112 yards and a touch. However, they need to really get this running game going. And that way, this quarterback can start to turn the corner and become the quarterback that we believe he is but i will say one thing at least he finally has the rookie quarterbacks on the board with the touchdown because they hadn't thrown one in three weeks i said this one during the draft and i know i was kind of laughed at from some espn people about it but i told everyone anthony richardson is not ready he needs to sit and get more reps but he can't do it in game he's not ready to be on the field yeah, you're absolutely right, Alex. And I know what you're talking about, some ESPN radio guys making some comments about that. And look, you're right about it. Super talented guy. And a guy that we knew was a developmental quarterback with a super high ceiling. But absolutely, he flashes big-time talent. He flashes big-time arm talent. We know how great of an athlete this guy is. But he's a very, very raw player. And I think I'm with you. I think he could benefit from having a veteran quarterback starting right now and having him sitting on the bench and kind of learning this offense in the background, he is going to have some rough up and down games here starting for the Colts. Absolutely. Now I want to stay in the NFC North for a second because Sam Darnold four touchdowns, no picks versus a very good defense in Houston. This is why coaching matters. It's something we talk about on this podcast a lot, Alex. This is why the team around you matters. And this is also why letting guys develop matters at the quarterback position especially look they had the most impressive win I think Sunday they destroyed a very good Texans team biggest surprise of the NFL so far has to be Minnesota speaking of head coach and defensive coordinator a plus for these guys I'll say it again Brian Flores is the best defensive coordinator in the game what he's doing right now is absolutely unreal with this roster the last two weeks in particular Purdy and Shanahan struggle. Now Bobby Slowick and C.J. Stroud struggle. Those are top 10 quarterbacks and top five play callers in the NFL. I want to shift this real quick, though, because I got to get your thoughts on this, Alex. What if the Vikings win, let's say, 11, 12 games and have that type of season? What do they do with Sam Darnold? And do they trade J.J. McCarthy? Could that actually be in play here? Because... Alex, how do you move off of Darnold if he keeps this going? 
He's still only 27 years old. People forget that. He's been in the league a long time, but he came in as a pretty young guy, 27 still. And I think it's safe to say that Darnold still has a lot of football ahead of him here. I mean, look, that's only three years older than rookie Bo Nix. Right. And I don't believe anybody has broken yet, but he was the youngest starting quarterback in NFL history. He was a 20-year-old, wasn't even legal to drink in New York City, starting for the New York Jets. Now, that's the first thing. Now, to your original question of what do they do with J.J. McCarthy if he continues on this tear, something that we at PGF said that we expect him to have a good year, I sign Sam Darnold, if I can, to a two-year deal. I get J.J. McCarthy some more reps. And then I let Sam Donald walk unless, you know, they make the Super Bowl or something and let him walk. But I think they're not going to be able to hold on to Sam Donald. He's on a one year deal. He's if he maintains the pace that he's going, he's going to be a top 12 quarterback, a 12 ish quarterback. He's not going to have the yards, but a top 12 ish quarterback and probably command. 25 to 30 million dollars something as the vikings i wouldn't do when i still need pieces on my defense because right now brian flores is surviving because he's blitzing the hell out of everyone and they haven't been able to handle it and yes cj stroud was number four at least this season fourth against the blitz and they got beat 34 to 7 knowing that they were going to get blitz i eventually say they're going to let sam Donald walk because he's going to be too hot on the market wink wink raiders but he, they're not going to be able to keep him. The money's not going to make sense, even though they do have some some salary cap. I don't think the money's going to make sense to keep them unless they just feel that they have to keep him and they don't believe in anything that they saw in J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, I think it could put them into a really tough predicament here because if he plays like this at truly an MVP level and they have a great season, heck, like I said, let's say they win 11, 12 games, maybe even make a run in the playoffs here, that's going to be really, really tough to let a guy walk when he fits that system so well, when he plays so well with this team and they're having so much success to go to a guy like JJ, who look, I know they believe in this guy, but he's a big question mark. He's really an unknown player at this point to go from a proven commodity, so to speak with Sam Darnold and what he's doing. And this is all hypothetical. Obviously this would be a really tough situation for them. I think it would be really hard to let him walk and not offer him at least, like you said, maybe a two or three year deal here and see if this works at least in the short term because J.J. we know is a developmental prospect anyway, so it actually might benefit J.J. long term as well. But, man, what a tear this guy has been on. Atlanta, Kansas City, big Sunday night football game. Look, Atlanta just got out coached in this game. That was really my big takeaway here, Alex. The play calling late I thought was terrible especially that stretch play on fourth and short. What a terrible play call that was. Cousins, look, Kirk Cousins makes this team better, but I don't think they're going anywhere. I, maybe they're a wild card team, early exit at best. I think that's really all this team is at this point. Now, on Kansas City side, Patrick Mahomes, going back to last year, he's not playing at the same level, and I don't really hear anybody talking about this. The defense is winning games in Kansas City right now. The offense is fine. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're terrible. But it's not the strong side of the ball anymore for this team. It's become obvious. This is a defense first team. Now, look, Rasheed Rice is a legit X wide receiver. He's really emerged as a big-time player. Xavier Worthy is exactly what we thought, Alex, an overhyped gadget guy. And it's also starting to really feel like MJ's Bulls back in the 90s when you're talking about Kansas City. The best team, the best player, the best coach, and they get every call. Now, look, I don't need your help, NFL, if I'm the Kansas City Chiefs. I saw a poll question recently that showed they are now the most, quote-unquote, disliked team in the NFL. I don't think the refs are helping. I don't think Taylor Swift is helping. And I think winning, even when they don't look great, isn't helping i don't think atlanta is real and the reason is is because of the two people that are on their team that i don't think are real and that's specifically drake london and kyle pitts drake london was the number one quarterback taken in his draft kyle pitts was said to be the new freakazoid tight end at six seven six eight that's running a four five now that kirk cousins is here None of them are displaying any of the traits that we thought we would see once they got this offense humming. 
And so I don't know what's going on there. And I'm not blaming that on Zach Robinson, who I think is a good OC. I think it's the players. I, I don't know if they've checked out or it's been too long that they've been there and they just don't have the drive. But they need to step up if this team is going to actually show some real true 400-yard, four touchdowns, and 200-yard receivers. They have yet to do that. On the other side, you're absolutely right. But I do take offense to you saying nobody's talking about it because here, since last year, PGF 1,000% called the Kansas City Chiefs defense the number one defense in the league over the, even the Browns and the Ravens because we were watching the games and we said it, that Patrick Mahomes is basically a great game manager and not messing it up, even though his interceptions are a lot up a lot more this year. But he's not messing it up for his team and trusting that his defense is going to get the ball back or get the stops where he will have an opportunity to do Patrick Mahomes type things so that part I will say PGF was early on that and saying that this is a different Mahomes that we're seeing okay no, no nobody but us let's put it that way yes that's fair that's fair nobody else in the media <laughs> no nobody else in the media but us have been saying that and I it just sounds like crickets outside of this podcast at times Ravens Dallas this game was fascinating Ravens hold on to a win after they really dominate the first half over Dallas, I mean, it, at one point it looked like the Ravens were going to absolutely blow them out and win by a monster number. But look, I just don't think Dallas is that talented. They can't stop the run. And it's an even bigger issue this year than it was last year. Now, we said they had one of the worst off seasons, and it's showing up this year on the field. That win over the Browns looks less and less impressive every week. This isn't a good football team. And look, they made the mistake that we talked about all offseason, paying Dak Prescott, paying CeeDee Lamb, big contract extensions. Look, Dak isn't good enough to overcome an average roster. And with this defense, he's going to have to be great. And he isn't. Now, I'm, I'm not saying he's terrible. I've, I've said this a million times. I'm not saying Dak's terrible, but he's not great. And I think only a great quarterback can maybe overcome the deficiencies that this team has. At one point watching this game, Alex, the, the Ravens were averaging nine yards per play in this game. They ran the ball down their throats. It's alarming what we've seen from this Dallas front seven. They're weak. Look, the linebackers aren't that good. Their front four isn't that good. This team is going nowhere fast. I think they're in serious trouble. This team's going to miss the playoffs, Alex. Oh, wow. And gee, who was the podcast or media outlet that said that? I don't I don't know. Maybe you heard on PGF. I don't know. But OK, so first things first, <laughs> they don't have a running game. Zeke, come, Zeke had three carries for six yards. He is just completely washed. We kinda, I think we all saw that in uh, not even in preseason. I think we all saw that in training camp. Rico Dowdle. You know, he's maybe they're just not getting the carries or whatever, but it's their their running back room is putrid. Dak, I agree with you with Dak. I believe when he's surrounded with the right with the right talent, he's a top eight quarterback. I won't even say top ten. I believe he's a top eight quarterback as he was last year. The the this is the thing about being a GM or anything like that. How long have we been talking about the linebacker position with the Dallas Cowboys? I went on a rant last week about Lamar Jackson. I was like, how much long, how many years are we going to consistently talk about the same thing? We're a media outlet. I do not get paid millions of dollars to go scout or draft people or coach people or anything like that. If I can see it, or rather if we can see it, apparently all the fans have seen it, then I'm sure Mr. Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones and Will have seen it as well. I don't I don't care that you, that's not an excuse anymore. You've had years to replace since Sean Lee, you've needed to replace the running backs and you have, excuse me, the linebackers, you haven't done it and you haven't replaced the running backs as well. So sorry, you get no sympathy from me. On the other side of that, Lamar Jackson still in the game. Finally, something they should have done last week. And I said it when I was watching the game and I said it when I came and watched the podcast, I said, excuse me talked on the podcast that Derrick Henry should have had 25 carries. He has 25 carries last game. They are sitting, they are, they are sitting at as a two on one team and not a one and two team right now. Derrick Henry gets 25 carries, 25 carries, 151 yards, two TDs. That is what he does. It doesn't mean you need to do it. You're not going to need to do it every game, but that was a game you needed to do it. And Lamar Jackson using his legs, 14 carries for 87 yards and a touch. 
this is the type of team that you are. You don't need to sit in the pocket. That's not your quarterback. If you want to hear my thoughts on that, rewind back a week because it's not, and it didn't change on this week. Run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. You should be what we would consider in this current NFL, an upside down team. You should be running at least 100 to 150 times more when the season ends than you are throwing because that is the identity of this team. Steelers moved to 3-0. and I think this is a surprising 3-0 and start for them. The defense is absolutely elite. I don't think there's any way around it at this point. Three games in, they are lights out. Everyone is talking about Justin Fields. But look, he's a game manager. And I'm not trying to take a shot at the guy. He's been good. I, I, maybe not good. He's been okay. He's been okay. He hasn't looked bad. But look, he's got two touchdowns in three games. I think people are overreacting a little bit to Justin Fields because the team is having success. The offense is only averaging 17 points a game. That's how good this defense is. They've been absolutely lights out. TJ Watt is the best defensive player in the game. He's become unblockable. This guy is just an unstoppable force. This team is very one-sided right now. This game was tied at one point. It was a close game. Herbert gets hurt. Joe Alt, Joey Bosa, Rashawn Slater. That's their four most important players all get hurt. So the Steelers did catch a break in this game, but I also said this during the off season, watch out for Nick Herbig. I had him as a breakout candidate in this game, two sacks, two tackles for a loss, two quarterback hits. He is starting to flash for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Well, as we're recording this on a Monday night, I'd just like to say within the first five minutes, a bomb to uh, Jamal Chase and touchdown for Cincinnati. But I digress. I, I, I will say this. We did in our preview of the season, Brad, we did talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers having the opportunity to probably open up six and two simply because they have Atlanta, Denver, the Chargers, Indianapolis, Dallas, the Raiders, the Jets and the Giants. And the only two losses that we kind of saw there were just the Jets and the Cowboys. So before the bye, we thought that their front end schedule was going to look great and they were going to have a chance. But it was the back end is when they have to pay all of the division twice is where we thought they would falter. Now, in terms of what the Chargers are doing, yes, they did luck out, but I don't think they had a chance in this game anyway. Their team was based off of the run. And once you stuff the run, now Justin Herbert has to tell us, is it Quentin Johnston, Lam McConkey, Hayden Hurst, or Will Disley? You have to find your receivers. You know, Cornelius Johnson, I don't know, uh, Brendan Rice, Jerry Rice's kid. We don't know, and I just don't think they're ready for when the team comes in and shuts down the run, that they have the opportunity to keep up. Rams steal one versus the 49ers, and I think really save their season with this win. Special teams killed the 49ers in this game. The fake punt, that big kick return late, the missed field goal late that would have made it a 10-point lead. Rams had, and I talked about this last week, a gutless performance last week. They showed some real resolve in this game with so many players out. This is a bad loss for the Niners, though. Now, Brock Purdy, we were texting during this game. Man, he was lights out. I mean, what a game this guy had. And he was able to do it without McCaffrey, no Debo, Trent Williams is not in shape right now. He doesn't look very good. Ayuk has been MIA, and Purdy was sharp, made some great throws in this one, but unfortunately his team let him down in this game, and they're a surprising one and two team right now. First things first, a lot of kudos go to the Rams. Let's start on that side because they, you're right. They, they, this was a gutsy, gutsy win. When a guy runs 24 times for 89 yards, you know that they were in the mud digging and and just trying to figure things out. But Cooper Cup gone. Puka Nakua gone. Three starting offensive linemen out as well. And they beat the 49ers. Tutu Atwell, Demarcus Robinson, guys that you never really even, that none of you more than likely have on your fantasy team. Colby Parkinson, They everybody stepped up. The defense stepped up and bared down in that second half when they need to. And that is a young defense. However, on the other side, there's always two facets to Alex. There's troll Alex or there's BS Alex, and then there's, you know, having a serious conversation. The 49ers, the, the 49ers didn't get beat. The 49ers lost this game. Then that, that's not a shot at the Rams. Simply because Brock Purdy needed to use his legs, he used his legs 41 yards rushing. 22 of 30, 292, three TDs, that's very efficient. The problem was one of those 30 attempts that did not want to, excuse me, one of those eight passes that did not connect was wide open to Ronnie Bell from Michigan, 
who dropped a wide open ball, hit him right in the chest between the numbers. He simply drops it. If he catches that, it's a first down. They get to go into a mid row game over. So this is more about the 49ers not being able to execute. Rather, their, their skilled players not being able to execute the way that we thought they should because Brock Purdy put this team in position to win and threw a strike to Ronnie Bell. He dropped the ball. Did you know that Pint Glass Football is more than just this podcast? We have an exclusive newsletter. Sign up for free at pintglassfootball.com to receive articles and insights delivered straight to your inbox. But wait, there's more. We're excited to announce our brand new YouTube channel. Not only can you listen to our podcast on YouTube, but you'll also find exclusive video content waiting for you. So hit the pause button right now and go subscribe to our newsletter and hit that subscribe button on YouTube to stay connected with the latest football news and our exclusive content. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. We personally love the Pick'em game. Just pick between two and five players to build a Pick'em entry. Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in this week's game for a chance to win big. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Download the Underdog Fantasy app and sign up today with promo code PGF. That's promo code PGF to claim your special pick plus first time deposit offer up to $250 in bonus cash. The official ticketing app of Pint Glass Football is now SeatGeek. I can't recommend them enough, guys. I've been using SeatGeek for years. You want to go to a game this season? SeatGeek is here to take the confusion out of buying tickets, making sure you get the best seats at the best prices. With SeatGeek, you'll never have to worry about overpaying for tickets again. How? They put a 0-10 to 10 score on each ticket, so you know you're getting a good deal. But here's the real game changer. You can get $20 off your first ticket purchase with the code PGFPOD. That's right, $20 off with code PGFPOD. This season, make every game day epic with SeatGeek. Download the SeatGeek app and remember to enter the code PGFPOD to grab your $20 discount. The college football Saturday slate. Well, actually, let's start with fri- the Friday game was awesome. We'll get to that in a second. But this weekend in college football was absolutely must watch. And a team that we know is must watch is Colorado. Look, this team isn't great. And and we know they're not a great team. But they are a team that you got to circle when they play because that game was crazy. The Hail Mary in the last seconds, connects to force overtime versus Baylor. Then they end up winning it in overtime. They moved to three and one. I mean, that game looked like it was for sure over. Shador Sanders rolls out of the pocket, throws a nice deep ball and connects. I mean, it was unbelievable. It had to be a less than 1% chance that they win this game. They find a way to get it done. Travis Hunter, once again, my goodness, this guy alone is must-watch TV. Just if, if Colorado's on, Put it on your TV, guys. You've got to watch this guy play. He is so much fun. Both sides of the ball. We've never seen anything like this guy. Coach Prime. It's just an entertaining watch absolutely every week, Alex, with Colorado. You know, I don't have much to say about this game because, unfortunately, I was out and I missed this game. But I know that I did see the big plays Travis Hunter made, 7 for 130. But he also made the, if I'm not mistaken, he made the game-saving tackle when he uh, caused a fumble at the goal line and stopped the running back. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah, on on both on both sides of the ball, I believe he caught uh, like a fifty yarder, and then I think they went on defense. And the neck, and when they drove down, he did that. And it was like within a seven minute period, he did all of this between offense and defense. I am going to offer some critique because it's just what I do. Just looking forward to the NFL. Shador Sanders, you literally, 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 literally have to learn to throw the ball away. You have to speed up because this is the Big 12. This is supposed to be offense. You should be able to get rid of this ball a lot quicker. I do not know why you ended up with eight sacks. And you hold on to the ball too. You have to get rid of the ball at this level. You have to. The Friday night game, Illinois, Nebraska, two really surprising teams in the Big 10 had a back and forth game. This was one of the best games of the weekend. Illinois' defense is legit. Man, they fly around. They make big plays. Dylan Rayola, 
look, this guy's going to be the number one overall pick someday. What a talented kid this guy is. I mean, real talent. Doesn't look like a freshman at all when you watch this kid play. I mean, he looks like a guy who's been playing for a few years at this level. He can absolutely spin it. He's athletic. He's fun to watch. Had almost 300 yards, three touchdowns in this game. He can throw off platform, change his arm angles. Really a fun young quarterback to watch. But I didn't realize going into this game, Alex, that Illinois has a quarterback. First time really getting to see Luke Altmeyer. He was impressive in this game. And I'm not going to lie, I tuned into this game mostly for Dylan Riola. And because we had two ranked teams Friday night, standalone game, I'm like, all right, I didn't put this game on for sure. But Luke Altmeyer was really fun to watch. This was a great quarterback game. And look, it got me thinking the level of quarterback play in college football, the past, I'd say, three to five years is just crazy. It's so much better than it was 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I have to say that I'm, I'm not familiar with the, no, excuse me, the Illinois quarterback. That was my first time hearing about him. But, yeah, Dominic Real, we know that he's going to be thing. Hopefully we get to see between him and Nico and Arch. Hopefully we get to see them in some type of playoff run because they're both either freshmen or sophomores for the most part. A possible run from either one of those people and they get to play each other. But, yeah, I have to agree with you, Brad. I think a lot of these kids with the – because this was la- next year. Well, actually, this upcoming draft is the final year for – covid kids or kids that had a extra year of service so this will be the last year i think a lot of these kids benefited from maybe sitting a year and being able to watch and get a little bit more training just like a lot of the offensive linemen that came into the draft so i like it as they move to the next level they're going to look a lot better and be a lot a lot more ready to contribute immediately immediately at the next level yeah you mentioned arch manning i want to get to that game because arch manning gets his first start I absolutely had to tune in for this one. I know it was UL Monroe. I know they were a big favorite. I knew that it was going to get ugly. I mean, we knew that they really were no match for this Texas team. The stats aren't going to wow you when you look at the box score for Arch Manning. But watching this game, he had one ugly pick early in the game where he threw into heavy coverage, bad decision. But once he settled down, he really showed off some serious arm talent. This guy throws a beautiful deep ball. He's accurate. He can move. He's really a pretty good athlete. I mean, nothing like Eli and Peyton Manning. I mean, when, when you look at his uncles here, this kid is way more athletic, can get out of the pocket and pick up yards with his legs and throws lasers over the middle of the field. Look, I know it's Yul Monroe, and I'm not trying to overhype the kid. We know how much hype this kid's had. I was just excited to see his first start. I couldn't wait to watch this game. But, man, this guy flashed some serious talent, and I 100% understand the hype around this kid. I'm interested to see what they do when Quinn Hewers is healthy. Because, personally, now I actually had a conversation about it yesterday. I would have, I don't understand what Texas was doing in telling him to come back. Arch Manning was ready. He had already sat long enough. He had flashed the previous year. He, he, I would have told Quinn Hewers, you want to come back to school? Sorry, you can go someplace else, but not here. We're ready to move on with Arch Manning. I'm not sure why they brought Quinn Hewers back. I wouldn't have. I would have let him transfer. I mean, he could have been a guy that we could have ended up in at Michigan or at or at Ohio State. He was good enough. He's not. He's not a bum. He's going to be a first round pick. But I definitely would not have allowed him to come back. I would have moved on to Arch Manning. Let Quinn Hewers either go to the draft or let him go to another team. USC. Michigan, look, this was a great game, maybe the game of the weekend. I know I've said that more than once here, but we had some awesome college football games this weekend. USC looked like they had Michigan on the ropes in this game, and Michigan gets the ball late after USC had the lead, and USC just couldn't stop the run. Look, Michigan came back and beat them in this game when it looked like they had virtually no chance at all, just pounding the ball late in the game and goes on this long drive and ends up punching it in USC when USC looked like they really had control of this game. But here's the thing, Michigan, we it's uh, not too early to say that this is not the same team that they were last year. We talked about it last week. They just had too many guys to replace. They don't have the same talent level. Obviously, Nothing against Jerome Moore, but losing a guy like Jim Harbaugh, it, there, there was a lot to replace coming into this year for Michigan. I think they're a good team. I don't think they're a legit contender like they were last year. 
But this was a big win for them because USC really came in and played them tough. And even in a loss, I think USC showed some real toughness in this game and showed that they can play a physical brand of football in the Big Ten. I like what I saw from them, especially on both lines of scrimmage. I like what I've seen early on in the season with their new defensive coordinator. They just look like a completely different team. Maybe not as talented. Obviously, losing Caleb Williams hurts. Miller Moss has been really good, but we know he's not Caleb Williams. But as far as this new version of the USC Trojans, I think they're headed in the right direction, headed into the Big Ten here. But this was a fantastic football game. Yeah, if there's anything such as a good loss, to me, this was a good loss. You went to the big house. You put up a fight against, you know, Kalen Mullings and Donovan Edwards, both there. You knew they were going to end as well as Alex Orji, who we know is a running quarterback. So you knew what the game plan was going to be here. Obviously, you just got beat up by a team that's just been playing that way for a long time. But this was a good loss for USC, a first big test. They hung in there. They're still, you know, they. I'm not sure if they're going to stick with Miller Morse, but we'll see. But they have some other guys that should be coming in next year that will make this team a lot tougher. And I think they feel good going forward in the Big Ten if Michigan is going to be one of the po- future powerhouses because Ohio State isn't this tough. They're more skilled, but they're not as tough. To play, and I thought, and I thought they stood in the ring and went and, and slugged it out with Michigan. This was a good loss for USC. Yeah, that's a great point. And speaking of tough teams, we told you, PGF Nation, this off season that Utah was going to be a problem in the Big Twelve because this team is big, physical, nasty, hard nosed team. Look, this game against OK State was a great matchup in the Big 12 because you had two of the favorites in this conference. OK State was really the favorites to win this conference by a lot of different analysts. We took Utah at PGF. They didn't even need Cam Rising in this game, and I'm not sure, and nothing against Cam Rising, I'm not even sure they really need him going forward. This team is what it always is. Tough, hard-nosed, hard-hitting, disciplined, run-first, well-coached, big, big win for them. They turned it into a fist fight, and that is the kind of game that they want to play because that's where they're at their best. They're going to make the college football playoff, Alex, because they're going to win the Big 12, and I think when they get in, they could shock some people. Yeah, I'm going to be in agreement with you. Like I said, I thought that they would win the Big 12 simply based upon the trenches. They had the biggest and strongest on both sides of the line. Cam Rising not being there. I remember even when we were talking about it, we didn't even realize, oh, wait, Cam Rising's not playing? Well, yeah, he's not. They're still able to do a lot of that because they have clean blocking and they can trust their defense. So, but good game, Oklahoma State, you know, a team a team that's really built off of speed, being able to hang in there with one of the guys that like to slug it out. I thought it was a good loss for them as well. Yeah, and something that we talked about going into this year, and it really showed up this weekend, was realignment has already given us some huge matchups in the regular season here. With Michigan, USC, we had Oklahoma, Tennessee, Utah, Oklahoma State. I mean, those were all big top 25 matchups that we wouldn't have seen in years past. Now these are conference games, and this is why college football is exploding in popularity. This is why so many people are tuning in to watch this sport. Oklahoma, Tennessee, this game, I was watching about three different games. I didn't get to watch it as closely as I'd like, but I expected Tennessee to really blow out Oklahoma in this game because I don't think Oklahoma is as good as their ranking. I think they're kind of getting by a little bit right now, more on brand than in substance. I'm not sure Tennessee is as good as their ranking. I don't really know what to make of this game. I think Tennessee is clearly the better team. They win this game. I'm not sure they're a top 10 team. I think they're going to get tested in the SEC this year. But I think Oklahoma is in for a really, really tough dose of reality entering the SEC this year. I think they're in real trouble. Yeah, Brad. So with Tennessee, I think you're just seeing the gap between losing everything to the draft, going back to Milrow, they lost Jalen Hyatt, Can't, uh, the other receiver, you know, slips my memory. But what I will say, remember, Tennessee also had sanctions as well. So after they get past this year, they lost some uh, some scholarships on this year. I think you'll start to see what they could be because I've been a guy that's been high on Nico from from high school, I had him over Arch Manning just from my perspective coming into college. But what I will say, I do like what he's doing. They need to stop running him so much. And then obviously they they still held on to James Pierce. I think 
if depending if James Pierce comes out, which I believe he will, I don't know why he would stay, but if they bring back, they're going to be bringing back a lot of guys, even if James Pierce leaves. This team is going to be another top five team next year because they have all their scholarships and they're going to get some transfers because a lot of kids are going to want to go play with Nico. The job that Josh Heupel has done in Tennessee is certainly worth noting here because he has this program headed in the right direction for the first time in a long time. And don't get me wrong, I think they're going to face some tough tests in the SEC, so I don't know if they'll be able to consistently stay where they're at here with that top 10 ranking by the end of the year. It's going to be interesting to see. But with this new college football playoff, they certainly are going to be in the mix to maybe get one of those at-large bids. But Oklahoma, I think, is headed in the opposite direction here. Benching your quarterback in the first half. The offensive line is a mess. Look, I just think this team, a blue blood program coming into the SEC, is this is not what they had in mind coming into this conference. And I think it's going to get bad before it gets better here. If you enjoy the podcast, do us a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Once again, I'm Brad Fowler. He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast. Zencaster is the ultimate web-based podcasting solution. It provides high-quality audio and video podcast production and hosting. With a full suite of professional tools, podcasters can seamlessly record, produce, and publish studio-quality content all from one dashboard. Zencaster's post-production process takes the headache out of audio production. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with a click of a button. Coordinating all your guests to record in person is painful and tedious. Easily invite up to 11 participants per recording with one click. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code PGFP and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story.